This is the Skin Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and here we'll investigate everything skin science and dissect it from a scientific perspective, analyze it from a medical perspective, critique it from a consumer perspective, and give insight from an industry perspective. Oscar Wilde once said, one should never trust a woman who tells one her real age. A woman who would tell one that would tell one anything. However, the problem isn't always purposely disclosing one's age, but that your age can sometimes be written all over your face. What if someone was to tell you that your skin is what gives you away? Our skin is exposed to stress from the environment like UV and pollution, but also from inside our bodies via our metabolism. So today, we're going to focus on skin and longevity, what causes skin aging, and a little insight into what you can do about it. But first things first, with me here in the studio, we have uh, the world's loveliest spin doctor, as opposed to skin doctor, Angela McDonald. Hello, Angela. Hello. And we're back again. Thrilled to be here. All right. Once again. And once again, we welcome to uh, the podcast Dr. Doris Day, who is now an official friend of the podcast, no longer really a guest per se, uh, but she's a board certified dermatologist, specialist in laser, cosmetic, surgical, and aesthetic dermatology, a medical educator, and a highly sought after media personality, a clinical associate professor of dermatology at the NYU Langone Medical Center, and owner of a premier medical and aesthetic dermatology clinic in the Upper East Side of New York City. Welcome back, Doris. Great to be back with you. Happy to be a friend of the podcast. What an honor. <laughs> that just means now we're going to call on you pretty much every time and see if you're available. Awesome. Um, but uh, So today we, we're very excited about this one, in, this uh, podcast in particular, because uh, we're going to be talking about something that's kind of a buzz thing lately, which is skin age and longevity. Um, there's a huge kind of movement around longevity, meaning how can we live longer, better? Um, and age being, you know, we're, we're, we have a lot of testing and stuff going on genetically to see what our biological age is versus our chronological age, which are two distinct things. And so today we're going to address a lot of those, that, you know, that buzz that's going on around longevity and age and bring it to skin. How does it affect skin? How is skin age affected and longevity affected? So the first question I want to pose is to um, the women. Uh, of this podcast. Uh, what is the most concerning thing about skin aging in a women's perspective? Doris, why don't you take that first? Well, I, I find that it can start really young and now we're living a lot longer, but I see women coming, worrying about looking older at a much younger age. So women are coming in in their early 20s wanting to do preventative in-office treatments like neuromodulators, which would be like Botox or Dysport, in order to prevent the aging process. And I think a lot of what they get is misguided in that, yes, we want to be proactive about how we age and do the right things, but now there's a sense that you can go out and get lots of sun and drink and stay up late and stress and do all these things, and then you can get a treatment or a pill that's gonna undo the damage. And while we're getting closer to that, we're not really there yet, and the idea is that I can give them much better guidance about what they can do to age beautifully and age well. And so I came up with one of my best lines for my 20 year old patients and I tell them, nothing looks more beautiful in your 50s than sun protection in your 20s. So it's a lot of times it's guidance and helping redirect what they're trying to do and not give them only shortcuts. Right, so what's the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound, a pound of, of cure? cure. It's yep. more like a ton of cure. A ton of cure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so it's true. You know, at some point, uh, you, know, in a, you know, we look at science fiction, how they can like basically fix anything. You know, if you break an arm, they just put in a machine and it's automatically mended. Who knows in the future what we'll be able to do. But for now, we, we're not able to do that. And so it's much easier to prevent than to cure most of the times. Um, so, Angela, from your perspective, what, what is kind of your, your thoughts on well, and what I'll women... Kind of just feed on what Doris just said. If you look at the American Medical Spa Association statistics, um, what she mentioned there, the the twenty to thirty four year old um, patient is the lar is the fastest growing sector, and um, those are the ones who are coming in and seeking um, um, information 
more more readily than 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 the thirty four to fifty year old, even though the thirty four to fifty mm. fifty to fifty five year old still makes up half of the of the market of the target market for medical spas. So from my perspective, you know, I um, what I see is uh, women having children later and wanting to stay relevant with younger mothers that they're that they're side by side raising kids with. I see women um, in the career wanting to pursue their career longer and wanting to stay relevant in whatever field they're in as well. So they're seeking the skin rejuvenation and the skin health. They're seeking health, physical health along with that in order to be able to, to, to raise kids at a, at a later age, to work longer, to have a career longer and stay relevant with the, whatever age group that they're working side by side with. So is what I'm hearing that from a wom woman's perspective, the adage of growing old gracefully is not really in vogue now? Or am I mishearing? Well, you know, growing old gracefully can mean a lot of things. For some people, it means do nothing and go out there and, and just basically poison your skin by getting lots of sun and just don't do anything about it. That's not really growing old gracefully. I, I growing feel old, that growing right? old gracefully is, <laughs> is doing things like proper sun protection, having a healthy diet making sure that you take advantage of your genetics. If you're blessed and you won the genetic lottery and you have good genes, to do everything in your power to get the most out of your good genes. And if you don't have good genes, do everything in your power to make the most out of them so they behave as much like good genes as possible. And that's really what we're learning. Um, my worry is that the sense that there's a quick fix for things, and especially with the younger population where they think, well, it's not permanent, it'll go away, mm -hmm. but they miss out on the opportunity of knowing what they would naturally age like and what they would normally look like if they didn't do these interventions. And so I think we have to be very careful that just because we have things that we could do doesn't mean that we should do them. And the idea is to truly age gracefully, which means doing the things in lifestyle that are helpful and in office to balance out what we see structurally that happens, but understanding that there are structural changes that happen with age. It's different in women than it is in men, but we understand for both that there are specific structural changes so that there's no way that a 50 year old can look 20, a 50 year old or a 60 year old can look rejuvenated but they won't look like a 20 year old. And that's a good thing. I think there is something to the beauty of every decade. And my goal is to celebrate that, not to try to undo it or to, um, or to try to make somebody appear like, they, like they're you know, 20 or 30 years younger. Right, and so I guess it's an age appropriate type of uh, you know, mentality of looking the best you possibly can for your you know, age. Thomas, when you say age appropriate, you just made me think about something. Okay. When we talk age appropriate, thinking about what age is. Mm -hmm. And I think age is more than one thing. We have a chronologic age, which is that number that you should never tell, apparently. So I'll stop. <laughs> um, and then there's the actual biologic number, which is the epigenetic number, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's what you do to help your optimize your your chronologic number. And so biologically, we can be decades younger than our chronologic number. And so you're telling your true age. I mean, I do a lot of testing on myself and my biologic age, I'm happy to say, is decades younger than my chronologic age. And the older I get, the happier I am about that. <laughs> right. And I, that's, so, that's kind of what I was driving at. Lot. Yeah, that's what I was driving at a, a little bit, which is, you know, we can be happy wh with where we are, um, you know, uh, biologically, or I'm sorry, chronologically, um, and just be the best that we can be there. But with the science that we're now kind of, we're, we're understanding now, it may in the not too distant future be a, a big possibility to be decades younger biologically than, uh, you know, chronologically. And we all know people that just look, you know, quite young for their age, their skin quality is better for their age and vice versa, right? Um, and uh, as you mentioned, epigenetics plays a large role uh, as we're going to see now, is that we can't control our genetics, but we can control our epigenetics for in, in some capacity, not on all capacities. Um, and so that's really what I'm driving at is because it's similar to kind of um, the movement of, you know, uh, obesity versus, you know, embracing your body type. Where's that line uh, of where you're, you're, you're uh, adopting an unhealthy lifestyle versus just knowing where your genetics can take you? 
But at a certain point, if we understand enough about a genetics and epigenetics, and then clinically we can implement those things, then we have to ask ourselves, should we really settle for things that are unhealthy? And if you could argue that when, we, when our skin gets to a place where it is aged looking, there are things that are happening that are not healthy inside the skin, which we're going to talk about in a second. But before we get to that, I wanted to get a little bit of a man's perspective. I, being a man, uh, will give my own perspective. But we also have in the studio Dr. Brian Jones, who is uh, uh, an employee at Crown. He's the director of medical and clinical affairs. And he's, um, he's going to be off to the side here, and I'm going to ask for his opinion on this in a, in a second. It doesn't have to be long, but uh, he's going to be here just to provide some extra uh, commentary. But as a man, traditionally, men have not been super obsessed with uh, aging uh, well. Um, you know, character lines and all that stuff. Men, a lot of times, feel that the more kind of lines you have on your face, the more character you have. However, that has changed in the not so recent past, where a lot of men are now getting just as a, as many aesthetic procedures, if not more, uh, than women counterparts. Now, it wouldn't I wouldn't say as many men are doing that. I think that's pretty obvious. But there are a lot of men that are definitely taking care of themselves a lot more. Um, I think they accept, like as a man myself, I accept my aging, I think a little more than like my sister does, but you're still 12, Thomas, <laughs> you have to accept, honestly. but like I have a big line here. <laughs> <You're amazing>. um, <laughs> uh, so it's one of those things where, um, but there are things that I do that I definitely take care of my skin. And I, you know, of course I do research in, in regenerative medicine and such. So I have a little bit of an edge over most men probably do about what I have access to. But I don't think uh, overall men are as uh, concerned, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be. Um, and one of the reasons is what we'll talk about later, which is about the skin being a manifestation of your overall age and health, um, biological age and health, and how we should be very much looking at that as a signal and how it is actually one of the best signals as you're up to your biological age. So Brian, what's your thoughts really quick before we move on? Well, I guess I won't say what my age is, but AARP has me on the frequent <laughs> mailing list. But uh, again, I think everybody's right is that uh, for, for men, it's more of distinguished as you age. But again, you think back as towards when you're in your younger teens and the sun exposure that you had uh, at, the, at that age and wondering whether or not it's going to come back and show up as uh, you know, skin cancer or some type of, of condition on your skin. So again, there is some concern, but again, it's nothing that uh, compared to what uh, women feel and, and their concern about skin. And I would say, Thomas, that, you know, I agree with what Doris said. You're not a it's man. about <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> uh, it's about growing old gracefully, I think now, but with intention, because there is so much that we can do to um, ch turn back the, the hands of time a bit in terms of how we look, in terms of how we feel. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things, I think we all listened to um, a podcast recently that talked about how it's all connected. What's going on on the outside is also reflected on the inside. And I think that's what we're looking for as women these I think days. that's just what I said. Just <laughs> um, I think that's what's good yeah. is that, you know, we, um, you know, can be very intentional about growing old gracefully and not just allow it to happen, but actually do things to affect overall skin and health. Right, and that's kind of, it comes all the way down to aging in general, but skin is again, a manifestation of us completely. But um, aging in general, we all want to live the whole of our lives as healthy and happy as possible, right? So nobody's gonna say to you, you know, I wanna you know, gradually get worse off and be in more pain until I die. You know, there, no, everybody's <laughs> like, we, we accept our mortality, but we would like until the day we die to be in perfect health to be cognitively there 100%. And then, you know, we go to sleep and then, you know, that's it. I think most yeah, people- My dad had yeah. the best line for this. He said he wanted to die young at an old age. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's that the goal, line. right? No, he always yeah. said that. That's the goal though. That's the goal is that, you know, we want the best quality of life. And that's why in, this, in the skin industry, in the dermatology industry, when you first get into it, you have to kind of ask yourselves, especially as a scientist, I'd ask myself, you know, what's, what am I gonna do uh, what am I, what mark am I leaving on the world? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? And uh, a lot of it comes down to the skin. When we, when we actually make the skin better for people, it improves their quality of life. Things like acne, aging, you know, all these things improve quality of life when we can solve them. Um, it allows people to go through, uh, you know, their life with confidence. And, and also, as we talked about, a lot of times what we see on the outside uh, reflects what's on the inside. But the caveat there is there are some aesthetic procedures that can mask age, right? And we'll get into that in a second. The first, but before we do, uh, before we get into that, 
I did want to talk to um, what causes skin to age. And so let's really briefly um, talk about what causes skin to age from a perspective of like your, your, your um, patients, Doris, what do they think uh, causes skin to age? What is, what is their mindset of what I should or shouldn't do to keep my skin young? Well, everybody comes in and they say, well, I know, I wish I could go back and do less sun exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we know that probably 80 to 90% of skin aging from the external factors is from UV radiation. And we know down to the matrix metalloproteinases, the thymine thymine dimers, genetics that already have you starting off with a few hits, depending on your skin type and your, your family history of skin cancers and aging, that some people are prone to these things at a younger age than others. And mm -hmm. so all of those things, patients will come in and say, oh, it's gravity. My gravity is always there. <laughs> we didn't just, gravity doesn't just happen when you hit a certain age, but at a certain age, when you lose the collagen support, you lose hormones that are building collagen, you lose the ability to repair and mm -hmm. naturally rejuvenate. Your skin does this every day, but as you get older and as you naturally lose estrogen, if you don't replenish it, and as you um, break down collagen and you're not replenishing it, then you'll see the effects of gravity and you'll see it in some areas more than others. And what we've learned is that you have bone, which is the skeleton, that's your foundation. You have ligaments, you have fat, you have subcutaneous tissue, and you have the layers of the skin. And they age at different rates. And so you, and even with fat, you have superficial fat and you have deep and deep fat in the skin that age at different rates. And I've even been seeing that the mid face ages at a different rate than the lower face. The lower face and around the mouth ages more like the neck. And so you really have to protect those areas and treat those areas differently. So when people get fillers or do treatments, the areas that we treat in the mid face and the cheeks can last for years, mm -hmm. but the lower face may be gone in as little as six months. And because the lower face is so functional, we have to be careful what we use in those areas to not make the face stiff so that when you try to talk or smile or move, you can still naturally animate. So there's a lot that goes into aesthetics of rejuvenation <clears throat> and that understanding of the functional aging is really in its infancy because before 20 years ago, it was really about age, fall behind, do a facelift and facelifts were about structural redraping. Right. Now, because we're not talking about surgical interventions, we're talking about non-surgical interventions, we're learning that there's a lot more that goes on. And so I talk about injection anatomy as opposed to surgical anatomy. And they're two very different things, even in the same face. Right. And, you know, I think that's uh, also on the subject of getting interventions for signs of aging. Um, is where we kind of need to also have the discussion of, okay, well, what is masking aging and what is actually addressing aging? So if, for instance, getting a filler for, uh, you know, for aesthetic purposes, like if you want bigger cheekbones is different than getting it because of volume loss due to aging, atrophy because of aging. But one thing about that a lot of people don't also realize is that, you know, we, we hear a lot of things about collagen in um, marketing. And uh, people understand, I think, that there's a lot of collagen in skin, which there is. Uh, what they don't understand is that there's multiple types of collagen that are all very different in the way that they are used by our body, that the connective tissue that actually holds our skin in place is actually also collagen. And so there's a lot more than just the collagen of the skin that is leading to aging and sagging as we age and such. Also, the connective tissue under the skin that holds it in place, these little anchors. We have little anchors that actually hold certain parts of our skin in place. Um, we have, uh, you know, septae within the fatty tissue even that actually mm -hmm. a lot of it's a lattice that actually holds some of the tissue in place and the fat in place. And so a lot of this is actually forms of aging as well or, or symptoms of aging as well. And in reality, uh, when we talk, when we talk about truly anti-aging techniques, it shouldn't just mask by like you talked about redraping or filling, but we should also address the holistic molecular and genetic causes of aging, which is what I would like to do. Uh, now. But there's one more aspect of it. When you talk about masking, yes. it's sometimes my most fit patients that need the most volume because they have low body fat. Sure. And so they can look more gaunt. So it's not always masking aging in terms of damage done externally. Sometimes it's a sign of somebody who is super, super healthy that can have lower body fat and, and they become more skeletonized. And 
I came up with the line, I don't want you to just be better. I don't want you to just look better. I want you to be better. Sure. Because what I see is that a lot of times we are, people come in and they just want things to mask what they see as signs of aging, Mm -hmm. but it's an opportunity to help them understand supplements and lifestyle changes they can make. Because in the end, there's really no shortcuts. Getting rid of all your lines and wrinkles doesn't really make you look younger. It's having balance that is important. And when you're healthier internally, it shows in your skin dramatically. And the beauty of this is, is that it can show in as quickly as a week. Just make one small lifetime lifestyle change of eating less sugar or mm-hmm. trying intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. You'll see the difference in your skin and in your eyes in just a few days. So the power of making an improvement is going on in your body, but the first place you'll see it is in your skin. Right. And so one, one kind of tidbit of information regarding what you just said is that uh, when you look at the different tissues of the body, uh, and we talked about this on our last podcast where we talked about skin remodeling. And so when you look in the tissues of the body, um, uh, we talked about the microbiome as well as the, the, the human cells uh, of the skin. Um, there are actually ways where you can actually, you can take the genetics of tissues of the body and look at the methylation patterns and such, and you can actually accurately tell a person's uh, chronological versus their biological age. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is that the skin is the most accurate of the tissues um, as far as correlating in the age, but that's the same as not, not just with uh, genetics of the individual, but also the microbiome. So you can tell by the composition of the microbiome how old or how young somebody is by as, uh, by a kind of a, what do you call it, a resolution of four years. And if you look at the different microbiomes of the body, you can tell that as well, but not as accurately as you can through the skin microbiome. And we'll get into that towards the end of the podcast a little bit about how that feeds into it. Because one thing that people tend to not realize is that it's all connected. When it comes to aging, it's all connected. Inflammation is connected to, um, you know, like uh, your health, meaning um, you said they're more healthy because they're, they're thinner, but sometimes being too thin is actually unhealthy. We all know that. Um, yeah. So the right, and it's what a hormetic kind of thing where too little is not good, too much is not good. We, we have this happy medium and that's in general in our bodies, for instance, oxygen, you know, oxygen, too little hypoxia, you die, you know, or, or it's, an, it's, it's also inflammatory to be hypoxic. Um, too much oxygen, you also die. Um, you know, too little water, you die. Too much water, you die. There, the thing is, most things in general have that phenomena of the right amount is the best amount. Um, and it's about understanding what that right amount is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it seems obvious, that. but then there's people that go out and they're drinking like these huge barrels of water every day thinking that's more healthy when what they're doing is they're flushing all their electrolytes out. And so, yeah. you know, you ask them, where did you hear that? And they're like, well, they, I was told to eat, drink eight glasses of water a day. So therefore more should be better. This more equals better phenomena. I just don't understand where people are getting that from, but they they have it. Same with exercise, same with everything. Um, That being said, um, let's move on to the genetic composition of what we know about the aging process, because this all will tie in towards the end all together as far as what we can actually do about it. You know, because we talked about masking aging, but, you know, that's one thing if you can't do anything about it. But if you can do something about it, then shouldn't we you know, shouldn't we propose that that should be your first kind of, uh, you know, attack is to actually try to prevent aging versus, we talked about it, prevention is better than a cure. So what is, what is prevention and how do we, how would we go about even deciding what that is? So to understand that, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm listening. I was, I thought you were asking the question, but I want to hear it to understand that I'm interested. So to understand that, you know, as a geneticist, I want to go deep and find out the molecular changes that occur uh, molecular and cellular changes that occur during the aging process. Now, there's still some mystery, a little bit of mystery around, um, you know, what kind of instigates this cascade. But we do know that it's interconnected in the sense that certain genes uh, do have changes as whether they're upregulated or downregulated. And so different genes are very important in the aging process. And what causes those changings? There's a lot of epigenetic stuff. There's a lot of environmental stuff. But then there's also some stuff that just happens to everybody. And we're still trying to figure out why. And some of the reason, the way that we can figure out why is by looking at animal models or some animals that last longer than other animals and seeing kind of where there's differences and similarities in the human genetics. So one of the molecules that is the most interesting to me 
is NF kappa B. And we're not going to get into too much of that because, you know, we don't want to make this uh, a technical le lecture that everybody's going to just fall asleep listening to. But I do want to mention this molecule because it's an example of one molecule that can have a huge impact over our health and not just aging, but we do know that, for instance, in a lot of tumors and for cancer, if we're talking about cancer, a lot of tumors, uh, we can see that NF kappa B is always on. So it's always being, um, promo it's always being uh, produced and, and it's always active. And the reason why this is an issue is that NF kappa B is actually a molecule that's very much a part of um, inflammatory uh, responses to uh, stimuli that are things like infections and such. And so we, we think of that as a good thing, which it is, but when it's out of balance and we're always, you know, inflamed at chronic inflammation, that is strongly tied to things like cancer, chronic inflammation. So acute is different than chronic. Um, acute is necessary for life. Chronic is where we actually lead to problems because it epigenetically changes other things. We have to remember that we have cells all over our body that have the same exact genes. So our heart cells and our brain cells and our, our skin cells all have the same genes. There's a reason why they're different, and it's because uh, of a couple of reasons. Well, there's many reasons, but you know, a main reason is because of the environment that they're in. And so it, it, because of their uh, neighbors, they get signals from their neighbors, get the, they get signals from their neighbors, and those all tell cells exactly where they should be and what they should be doing. And so when those environments start to shift, just like what we talked about with the microbiome, when the, when the environment shifts, it shifts the ability for that cell to do what it's supposed to do. And so then it starts to change epigenetically what it expresses genetically. So we actually are gonna affect our genes of any given cell based on the environment that it's in. And a, and a chronically inflamed environment is gonna be very effective in changing the expression of certain genes. And so NF kappa B is one that we find that when it's out of control, it can, it can be associated with things like cancer, obesity, and what we're talking about today, which is aging. So the real question is, okay, why does it have, why does it play a role in aging? And part of it is, you know, because it actually um, blocks other genes that are important in uh, the things that fight aging uh, in actually from being expressed. And one of the main ones is something that we're, we've been talking about uh, quite a bit recently, which is the sirtuin genes. And so that got a lot of, the sirtuin genes got a lot of um, airtime several years back because uh, scientists were looking at resveratrol and, and, and other type of antioxidants were actually upregulating these genes. And these genes were efficient in reducing the amount of senescence, uh, which uh, to anybody who doesn't know what senescence is, it's basically when cells, cells only have a limited ability to divide. You know, a, a skin cell can only last for so long. It can only make daughter cells because they divide every, you know, they divide, everybody knows that, they divide. And they can only divide so many times before they crap out because their genetics becomes... Uh, in danger because the telomere is short and we're getting really technical here, but uh, I'm going to get past that in a second. But um, so we, we only have a certain amount of times that can happen before they become what's called senescent, which means basically they're ready to die. They're ready to be, you know, they've gone through all their divisions. They're ready to die. And typically they give out these inflammatory signals that tell the immune system to come and gobble them up, get rid of them and, and get rid of, and, and then that way they won't cause any issues with the rest of the body. Um, additionally, there are also other type of, um, regulatory uh, pathways where you can uh, cause what's called synomorphics, where it can pr do make, it can delay senescence. So you can actually inhibit a cell from getting senescent and leading to issues. And so that's kind of another way that the body deals with that. But unfortunately, over, over time, we lose this ability to monitor for these senescent cells um, and they start to accumulate. And the more they accumulate, the more infla inflamed the tissue gets. The more inflamed the tissue gets, the more this NF kappa B uh, is going to uh, be expressed because it's kind of this uh, feedback loop between inflammatory signals and, 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 sec and secrete or um, upregulation of this NF kappa B. So it becomes this like horrible cycle. And so that's why scientists are now looking for these molecules that can actually reduce things like NF kappa B because they're thinking if we can break the cycle, we can then start to see if we can actually reverse the aging process. And they've shown in some animal models that they can do this. And a lot of it centers on these sirtuin genes and genes like these sirtuin genes because these sirtuin genes, if we um, look at what they do, is they basically are uh, uh, factors, uh, genes, there's, sev there's, there's, quite a, there's quite a few of them, less than 10, I think, uh, I think there's around six of them. 
And these, these genes uh, actually can uh, delay the telomere attrition, which is what we talked about, why there's a limit to how cells can divide, because it delays that, about, that, 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 um, that shortening of the telomeres every time it divides. It sustains integrity of the genome that way. And then it also promotes DNA damage repair. And so DNA damage repair is where, when Doris was talking about um, UV damage caused by the sun, one of the things that is the reason why we can actually remodel and heal from that is because those thymine dimers that are created and other genetic issues that happen because of UV damage, our body can fix those. We have genes that that's all they do is they go and they fix these, these genetic uh, mutations that happen or these thymine dimers or these, um, you know, these, these, these things that, that can happen genetically when we're uh, exposed to radiation. But when those genes are turned off and we dampen that ability, we get things like mutations and we get things like uh, you know, histones that are, you know, not regulating properly so you can have proper uh, genetic regulation. And so this all is to say that there are some fundamental genetic elements that we do know about that if we can cause better regulation of those genetic elements um, through epigenetics, we might be able to not only delay aging, but actually reverse aging. And that's where Doris was talking about uh, actually being younger biologically than you are chronically, because you can actually change that. If you can actually remodel your tissues and your genetics through instigation of these epigenetic type of anti-aging in the real sense, where we call it, what do we call it? De-aging versus anti-aging. Because, yeah. yeah. So if you can actually do that, you can actually reverse your biological age. Now, can you live forever? Probably not. But you could probably live better for longer. And that's where the real question comes in. This is all great, but is there anything we can, we can do right now that would allow us to do what we just talked about, which is you know, upregulate those sirtuin genes, downregulate things like NF-kappa B. Uh, um, and so Doris, I mean, there are some things that we've talked about uh, you know, as far as like flavonoids and such. What are your thoughts on what we can do now to actually improve our uh, aging process? Well, you know, I love that discussion. And this is something that I worked on 30 years ago in, uh, in a lab at NYU with Mickey Blumenberg and his postdoc, Mariana Tomek-Hanek. We looked at uh, retinoids, the effect of retinoids, antioxidants on skin cells. And specifically, the marker that we looked at to see the benefits or detriment was NF-kappa B. Mm. So this is something that scientists have been looking at, and we're getting better at it to understand, but it also helped me understand the power of what you put on your skin. That what, if you have the right formula of skincare products, retinoids, antioxidants, peptides, hydration, and, and you protect that biome. I mean, we didn't talk about the biome then, but it turns out that it does affect the, the skin biome as well. Mm -hmm. So we're building on the foundation of understanding those markers as a measure of how well we're doing and then looking at the ingredients that will help up or down regulate those markers as a sign of our success in that. So I think use, taking supplements is really helpful. And so I've added several to my, uh, to my list of things that I take and what I recommend to some patients, not every patient, and then topicals as well. Uh, but honestly, diet, exercise, sunscreen are the three most important things that will affect 90% of it. And then the other 10% is all these other things. So if you really want to protect, just start as simple as sunscreen every day and being sun smart, which means right. um, use it, wearing a hat, sunglasses, physical protection, sun protective clothing, avoiding midday sun, making sure you have enough vitamin D from your diet, not as from the sun. And then you can add in things like metformin that, that you know, I think is a great thing to add in uh, for the diet. I think it's one of the most inexpensive and helpful supplements that will help you age. Also, there's a fern-based extract called uh, polypodium leucotomus extract that has been shown to have some benefit, a good amount of benefit against UV and pollution. So it's not going to make you not burn if you go in the sun, but it'll help reduce the damage and right. it will optimize your sun protection. So there's a lot of things we can take and a lot of things we can apply to the skin that will help reduce the stressors from pollution and UV rays that are unavoidable after we try all those other measures to reduce our exposure. I don't want anyone to not go out in the sun. I think sunlight and sun it's so important for our sense of well-being and, and our health. 
but it doesn't mean that you have to damage your skin in the process. So it's not that you should be indoors and be a vampire, you know, like, right. like a vampire. It's just be sun smart and make the most of your time outdoors. Right. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, the sunscreens that we use are not usually 100% effective. So you're going to get a little bit of that wonderful sunlight yeah. and you do need a little yeah. bit of the, the UV in there. And no one's applying enough. That's We're right. Enough That's right. Enough. So although so they, they label right. it SPF a certain, it's usually not getting that SPF. So at the end of the day, you do want to go outside. And again, it's one of these things where these these uh, mechanisms we talked about, which is a little bit is going to be good, right? You, you Not too much, not too little, because you do need a little bit of sunlight for not just for your skin health, but also for your just sanity. Um, That's what I meant was for your sanity. Yeah. And the time to go out is the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Right. And then also, you know, there's a myth about, um, you know, vitamin D production. We know that you can get that through your your diet. Um, and yeah, really, it's naturally found in foods. You yeah. know, it's not like it's the only place to get it is from the sun. So I wouldn't count on the sun. And also, you know, we don't really have good data on as you get older or as you have a lot of sun damage, is your skin really making vitamin D from sun exposure? Mm -hmm. So we all talk about 10 to 15 minutes of unprotected sun exposure, but for somebody who's very fair, that'll fry them. For somebody who's very dark, it'll do nothing. <laughs> right. And so I, I don't think there's an, an amount that you can have. And then again, as you age, is that as a fit, efficient? Are there parts of the bodies where those receptors are better? Until we really know those things, I'm sticking with vitamin D should be as a supplement or it should be from your food. Pretty and there's lots of foods, nuts, fish that have vitamin D, eggs um, that you can naturally get. Foods are fortified with vitamin D. Um, so don't count on the sun. I, I, anybody who's not a dermatologist who doesn't see all the melanomas and skin cancers we see in younger and younger patients, it's, it, it's just to count on vitamin D from the sun. I'm just going to stand up and say, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't count on it. But I, I do think that even with sunblock, you're going to get some vitamin D pr production. Well, that's for you know. sure. Yeah. That's for sure. Okay, I'll let you say that. Yeah, right, yeah. I'll allow yeah. that. So I, I would <laughs> say, you know, you do want to go outside. You know, I, I'm, I actually don't go out enough. But, you know, when you put sunblock on, you're going to get some vitamin D pr production yes. anyway. So uh, that's true. it's just being wise about, you know, I, I know people Thank like you. you say, Doris, that they think, oh, I got to get my vitamin D. So I'm going to go sunbathe for a half hour. Not this. It's not necessary, nor is it healthy. But anyway, moving on, you know, yeah. Angela. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll add to the conversation a little bit, just kind of going back to what you said earlier, Thomas, about, you know, our immune system and inflammation. And, you know, for, for those of, of you who know me, you know that I'm a breast cancer survivor. And, and when I spoke to Thomas the first time after diagnosis, one of the things you helped me understand was that all of us carry cancer cells. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of, is your immune system healthy enough to fight those cells and inflammation being a big part of why your immune system is not able to fight cancer cells and clear cancer cells. And so, you know, having been through now cancer treatment and, and looking at uh, working with a, a well-known integrative oncologist out of Chicago who has Dr. Keith Block, who's written a book called Life Over Cancer. Mm -hmm. And being in his program now, he has, that's what he does. He optimizes the body to fight cancer cells. So through a series of supplements and, and extensive blood work, he's able to, to, to judge whether he's hitting the markers that he wants to judge. And, and he's doing so by supple monthly su supplements, daily supplements, but also in uh, quarterly infusions as well. So that whole idea of, of we can change the, the, um, the, our immune system and inflammation in our body through through taking supplements is is near and dear to my heart. And then being part of the medical aesthetic industry and realizing too that outwardly we can be doing th doing things just as Doris said through topical ingredients to counteract mm -hmm. what we see on the outside. So two subjects you know that are are very close to to my heart is both what we can do both internally and externally. And, and Angela, you're 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 so right. There's actually we use sunlight in dermatology all the time to reduce inflammation in the skin and treat conditions like eczema and psoriasis, which are sun sensitive and even some cancers like mycosis fungoides, we sometimes use sunlight. But what we've done is we've been able to filter out wavelengths of UV light down to narrow bands of UV. So UV is a, wave, is a series mm -hmm. of energy wavelengths and it's, so it's a spectrum mm -hmm. and we can narrow it down to just a few uh, uh, just a, a few elements of that wavelength, a few numbers of that wavelength, where we lower the risk of cancer, but increase the risk, the, the benefits of the anti-inflammatory. And so that's something, because I see patients now 
who had something called PUVA, which is Sorlins, which enhances your sensitivity to light, plus UVA, which is every day, all year round. It's 90% of the rays that reach the earth. And seeing those patients now, they're covered in sun damage and skin cancer. And every time they come in, I'm having to take things off them. Fortunately, that's gone. And now we can narrow it down to safer wavelengths of light. But so there may be a safe way to tan with UV light. It's going to age the skin, but mm -hmm. it may not increase your risk of skin cancer. So they're not always connected. Also, Angel, does your um, person talk about wild turkey mushroom extract? Um, it talks about a lot of different things. It's a very, very specific program, and diet's a big part of it, as we talked about as well. Be, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a plant-based diet. It is, you know, free of dairy, um, so a very, mm -hmm. very specific diet. Yes, I know, Thomas. <laughs> the I told and you I so. And I think it works on skin also. I mean, mm -hmm. and then also proper screening. Yeah. Well, here, Thomas here's... doesn't agree with that? No, I do. I think dairy is one of the things that I everybody gets on my case because I don't like to eat dairy products. And it's not because I can't digest them. Everybody thinks it's because I'm lactose intolerant, which I'm not. It's because I just don't think they're healthy. I think that, you know, diet's very important in reducing inflammation, which is tied in to things like cancer as well as aging. And so, uh, you know, for me, I, I find I take pride. I call it, I won't call, I won't say what I call dairy don't products, but, it. um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't partake now, of course I don't, you know, I'm, I try not to be rude. If somebody offers me a meal with something and I'll just pick around it or it's not like I'm allergic to it. Um, but anyway, that being said, um, you know, what you guys were talking about, or gals were talking about just now, as far as cancer is so tied into aging because the immune system, there's very similar mechanisms that lead to carcinogen or to tumor genesis that lead to aging. And part of that's the immune system has the ability to uh, what's called T reg cells. And so T reg cells can actually uh, tell the immune system to kind of tone it down because it's okay here. And it's part of our uh, the way that our immune system with our microbiome and other things that we come into contact, it's a part of the adapted, uh, adaptive immune system. And they're very important because they, they allow us to function in this world that is not sterile. But the problem is when there are too many of them, they can actually allow things like cancer cells to get away from our defenses. And similarly, that's how aging also starts to accumulate those senescent cells. Because senescent cells, the T regs are the ones that kind of say, you know, um, it's okay, you don't need to get rid of this senescent cell. And I believe that there's like um, also an accumulation of T regs in the skin as we age, which is one of the reasons that we think that there's also a accumulation of senescent cells. And so there's this kind of similar thread that we were talking about through these disease states, as well as with aging. So, you know, while we don't look at aging as a disease state, in a way, it kind of is a disease state. Um, it's a similar thing to almost like cancer in a way in the sense that our, our body is now not functioning the way it was intended to function. And that's why we start to lose things like skin elasticity and integrity of our connective tissue. And really, when you think of connective tissue, that holds us all together. So, but that being said, I want to move on to... Um, Can I ask one question of both you and Doris Thomas? Yes. It's kind of going back to what you said earlier in terms of what causes skin to age. You know, when I look at my situation, um, my health concern, I think stress played a huge part in it. Of course. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, I was exercising and I was eating well, but yet I was under a tremendous amount of stress from a number of different areas. And, and I think that ultimately affect my immune system. So what, you know, what role does stress play on aging, would you and Doris both say? Hmm. Do you want to go first, well, Doris? Stress <laughs> plays a very big role. And one of the things I talk about in, in my book called Beyond Beautiful, and I talk about my patients on a daily basis, is that life is full of stress and stress can be very positive. So we, we can't avoid stress. I mean, I live in New York City. We're, we just, we live on stress. It's our food here. <laughs> but it's not about having stress. It's how you manage the stress and how you perceive it. So if you change your perception of it, and as we get older, you have experience. So you go, okay, well, I've been through stuff. I'm here. So I can overcome and I can handle. And then you have that comfort of saying, not only the end of the world is the end of the world. And not everything else has to be the end of the world. So even getting a very... A horrifying diagnosis as you had, Angela, and I'm, I'm so happy you're okay. Um, that feels like the end of the world. But then you look at the data and the statistics and the care that we have and the access we have to healthcare, and we say, okay, well, I'm going to handle this. And you just put measures in place to say, I'm going to deal with what I can, get myself as healthy as possible, do what my doctors tell me, and I will be okay. 
Um, life is, is, that's part of the journey. And then finding that there's a good side to it. I had a patient who um, I ended up diagnosing with melanoma that ended up being metastatic melanoma. And I got him into these clinical trials and now he's more than 10 years out and cancer free. He's cured. Right. Of, what was otherwise a death sentence. Mm -hmm. And he told me that was the best thing that happened to him because basically he was a schlub. I mean, he was just getting through slogging through every day, no real purpose and didn't diet, didn't exercise. Once he had this, he's run three marathons. He, you know, he's, he moved out to California, has like this most amazing rich life that it opened his eyes to that. So I think with every, everything, there's a flip side and there's an opportunity and it's when I see people who go through those difficult moments in time, but they don't see it as a stress that's like the end of the world, but as an also something they have to get through. And then they see that they now can help other people or have a different purpose in their life that they didn't ask for and didn't deserve, but they make something beautiful of it, as I know that you're doing. So, um, so I think that's the thing about stress is that stress is different things. I see people who break out from stress, people who get ulcers from stress, people whose hair falls out from stress. So they're all different stressors that people handle differently. And there's personality types that will handle different stressors with different parts of their body. It's so interesting to me um, how real that is. So I try to look at my patients and break it down to where I think their stressors are carrying them and then help them with tools as much as with products and treatments and diet and exercise and all those things, but actual tools to look at their stress from a different point of view. And I think that's one thing physicians could do more that doesn't cost anything, but has a very big impact. Right. And you know, I, the way that I deal with stress is I just sweat a whole lot. Um, no, <laughs> does that work for you? It really does not work for me. Um, but, uh, actually, you know, stress induce inducing stress. Again, this comes back to epigenetics because when we are stressed out, we do release certain chemicals and we upregulate certain genes that does change us genet or epigenetically. Yeah. And so we see uh, certain things like um, that's why certain people go prematurely gray, um, you know, and now, I, I, you know, I've, I heard on uh, that uh, David Sinclair's podcast, you're talking about hair going gray and then reversing. I'm not sure I I've heard, idea. I've not heard too many people showing that we can reverse graying hair. I know we can prevent it more. Um, but I'm super interested in that because, you know, that's another thing we can talk about another day because I have some great thoughts on how to reverse graying hair, but it's not by de-stressing. <laughs> um, go ahead, Dorsey, you had something? No, one of the, the easiest things to do to change your stress pattern is to control your breathing. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as a sigh can totally change your stress level. I see people with TMJ all the time and they're grinding, grinding, grinding. And stress tends to lead to more stress. Right. So we, we clench, we grind, and I want them to do it in the office. So I teach them to sigh. And I've learned that we actually naturally sigh all the time. It's part of our natural breathing. And if you don't sigh, you actually get very sick and die. So sighing is mm. a natural part of our breathing. We're not breathing at the same rate all the time. Every now and then we sigh. So if you pay attention, you see you're doing it. But if you intentionally sigh more often, when you do that, you cool the brain, you improve your oxygen level, and you end up thinking more clearly, and you just change your whole direction of stress. So sometimes it's as simple as a deep sigh or a slow, deep breath that's controlled, and then having an intention of changing the, the path that you're on. Okay. So when I'm when I'm passive aggressively sighing at people, I'm just going to tell them it's because I'm, I'm trying to de-stress. No, that's a yawn. <laughs> a yawn is different. A yawn is a sign of hostility. Oh, okay. So that's <laughs> different than a sigh. Um, you know that in animal models that when they yawn, they're actually about to, they're like, I don't like you right oh now. Oh my goodness. My dog <laughs> yawns all the time. He hates me. There you no, go. I'm just kidding. There you go. Um, so, you know, coming back to the, the topic here though, is um, when we, when we think about these, uh, these these things that lead to aging we talked about how there's a common thread with cancers and aging and such interestingly again to that common thread there are there's a, there's a lot of um, research right now about senolytics trying to you know make drugs that are either novel uh, yeah novel or even existing whether we can use them to rid the body of senescent cells or actually to make those senescent cells not senescent anymore or to delay senescence and interestingly a lot of the ones that are being investigated are either alone or in combination chemotherapeutic in nature. They're, they're cancer drugs. 
and it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, the, the real question is, you know, what the correct dosage is and, and all that, because it's a very different reason you're using it. But also there's a lot of great natural molecules that they're showing have benefits to doing these things. So things like um, neuringinin, which is a flavonoid. And there's actually a list. Uh, of, there's a paper that I can actually put in the notes of this podcast that there's a list of flavonoids and other molecules similar that are found in you know, fruits and vegetables that uh, we can find today as a, a supplement that actually th do things like um, downregulate or block NF-kappa B in part. Um, and has been shown clinically, this particular one, Naringian, uh, actually is clinically shown to in, uh, reduce skin age and senescence uh, in senescent cells and skin. And so there are things out there already that we can do to start to uh, lower our biological age in our skin. And we imagine if our skin is lowering, it's probably systemic as well. So it's very important that we, um, you know, as uh, people in this space and science, as scientists and clinicians, and as an industry, start to look into how we can not just make skin look better, but actually skin uh, look younger, but actually skin to be younger. And I think in the next probably decade or so, there's going to be a world of difference in, in how we practice uh, dermatology because of this. And I'm super excited about it. And we're not even halfway through, although we are more than halfway through. Uh, yeah, but is it bad that I'm thinking that with all these things, I can now go out and eat Tito's and Doritos and get sun <laughs> and even smoke and then just take these pills and then just undo all the damage? Like, you know, everybody sort of wants that shortcut. I kind of like the idea because I really like Tito's and Doritos. I don't really like the sun, but I like mm -hmm. those. I like those <laughs> awful foods. And I would love to be able to eat them and not have the damage. Right. And maybe someday we'll be able to do that more more easily. <laughs> but as far I'm as damage, that day, as far as damage, yeah, as far as damage is concerned, though, we do want to briefly talk about these this idea of mimetics of things that are mimicking adversity or abundance. And so we, we know of this kind of phenomena where if we do intermittent fasting or something that is going to mimic a stressor, because you talked about stress being a bad thing, but acutely stress is actually not a bad thing um, because it allows our body to actually go into a kind of mode where we upregulate certain genes, downregulate certain genes, and it's been shown to be beneficial for the de-aging type of uh, uh, mechanisms. And so there's things like excess heat, excess cold for acute periods of time that I really wanted to briefly mention. So with heat, we know that sauna uses of, of sauna over time has low can lower, and it's been shown in studies to lower uh, cardiovascular issues. Um, now, that being said, in dermatology, we tend to tell people you shouldn't take hot showers um, because hot showers can actually uh, reduce your skin barrier and lead to like exacerbation of things like eczema. And so Doris, what's the happy median there? Well, maybe sauna, which is dry heat, can actually pull more oils and have a benefit, and you want to minimize the long hot showers because there isn't a benefit there. Uh, so it's it's how you get the heat or how you get the cold and how long. And I, I've, I've seen athletes, unfortunately, who are so good at powering through difficult and painful mm -hmm. situations that they don't listen to their body right. and they, they keep powering through and you can die. I mean, right. there's, a, there's an nth degree of this that is going too far and it's listening to your body. If you don't feel good in that situation, then stop doing it. And you don't necessarily have to go for so long or do so much. So build up to things always see your doctor first. Mm -hmm. And if you, I, I see people who, who are told to wash their hands and they come in and their hands are washed literally raw. Yeah. They've washed off the outer layer of their skin. Their biome is destroyed. And now they're more prone to infection, but they keep washing their hands and their hands actually physically hurt. So they're washing your hands is a good thing, but excessive of anything is not a good thing. And so we need to educate people on what those parameters and barriers are. Right. And, and now I have to hop up. I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> Doris, thanks so much. We didn't we didn't get everything done that we want or discussed that we want to, but we're gonna stay on this a little I'll longer. Be back. Yeah, you'll be back. But we're gonna we're gonna finish with a, a couple of things. Uh and Doris, okay. it was always a pleasure. Um Hi, have a wonderful yeah. evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. So, um, you know, we, we got to uh, most of the first part. We just had way too much fun talking about some of these things. Um but I did want to bring a couple of things back into kind of uh, consideration before we we uh, we finish the conversation. Uh, where are we, uh, Alan? As far as time, uh, yeah, six, minutes. six minutes. Okay, so we can go a little bit over. I think that's okay. 
I'll ask the boss. We can do whatever he said, we want, okay, yeah, right? So, um, <laughs> so uh, all right. So, um, and then I, I'd like to get a little more feedback from uh, Dr. Jones over here as well. Um, I do definitely want to get into the microbiome and how okay. that plays into aging. And so Doris and I, uh, we are writing a book on the skin microbiome. And one of the chapters is on uh, the effect of the microbiome in disease states. And one of those that I listed in that chapter was um, uh, aging. And the more I, I wrote about, the more I realized that there's a lot to say on this. But um, let me let me just skip down to that right now, which is what is the relationship with the microbiome and skin age? And so we talked about how there's genetic tests uh, and, uh, that you can do to look at your your biological age versus your chronological age, looking at DNA methylation and such. Same with the microbiome. We talked about that earlier as well, that um, you can look at the microbiome on the skin, and it's the best indicator of the microbiome on how old you are. Um, that is also, you know, arguably biologically versus chronically, although I believe that study was chronologically. But if we are able to reverse aging on the skin, the biome would not change as drastically. So therefore, it would probably more mirror biological age. Um, but um, we talked about last uh, uh, podcast about skin remodeling and how, you know, when we're younger, we are turning over tissues anyway, but there's less damage to turn over. Um, and as we age, we accumulate damage. And so uh, the, the, basically, we talked about the remodeling process. We'll move on from that. Go back and listen to that podcast if you want to hear more about that. But it has to do with all the, what we just talked about, which is we do know um, that the microbiome can, uh, with the C. acnes that we are very much uh, investigating at Crown Laboratories, C. acnes actually can uh, change and modulate um, depending on the strain of C. acnes, the way that the immune system acts. It can either be an inflammatory kind of modality or um, a, uh, a homeostatic or healthy type of uh, direction, depending on the strain of the microbe that we're talking about. And this, of course, when we tie in everything to inflammation, we basically say this is going to have an impact on age because if you're chronically inflamed because of the microbes any, in any given area, that's going to play a part in the aging of the skin, right? And so, um, regardless uh, of you know uh, of uh, of the microbes, also if we if our skin ages for whatever reason, we're gonna have changes to the ecology of the skin, like less oils, barrier changes, thinning of skin. Um, all these things are going to actually play into also the changes in the microbiome. And we what we have found is that we can actually see some reversal in these phenotypes. And this is where I'm going to ask Dr. Jones to come in because he's been looking at a lot of this lately. Um, we've seen some changes in the phenotypes of the skin, cosmetically at least. We're still investigating from a genetic and uh, molecular level. But when we add on uh, certain probiotic strains onto the skin over even as little as a week. Well, it's actually very surprising that we didn't expect to see this in our clinical studies, but certainly it, it's come true that, uh, again, a lot of the anti-aging associated benefits as towards lines and wrinkles, pigmentation and the like. Uh, barrier uh, improve actually with these strains. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's one, like you said, we did not anticipate that necessarily, but the more we're finding, the, uh, the more we're kind of looking in research and doing our own research, we're finding that um, not just the strains themselves, but also the metabolites that are um, secreted by these strains are epigenetically, as we talked mm -hmm. about before, changing the way that the skin is functioning. And so, you know, we have these endogenous and ex exogenous uh, you know, stressors, but also there's things that are good uh, um, as far as pushing uh, our skin to being a, I guess, a more youthful phenotype. And so the real question is, does it actually do it genetically? So phenotypically, we can see on the outside, but we need to know, is it really masking age um, or the signs of aging, or is it truly removing the markers of aging that we talked about with like senolytics and such. So I'd, I'd go back to the example that I just shared with, you know, cancer mm -hmm. cells. If we optimize our body, our immune system, mm -hmm. then our immune system is clearing those cancer cells. And I'm doing that now. You know, I am rated as free of cancer by my oncologist, um, in my, my team at UT Southwestern and their, their comprehensive care center. So I am essentially free of cancer, but I also understand now that for some reason my, my body didn't clear those cancer cells initially, so I'm doing something extra, and that's investing in integrative oncology to optimize my body to fight cancer cells should I be exposed to that situation again. And so, you know, it gets me thinking, Thomas, if we can take 
you know, supplements or do infusions or, or change our diet mm -hmm. or reduce our stress. You know, Dean Ornish says the same thing. He has a book called Undo It, where he looks at four premises of, of uh, eat well, um, love more is one of them, stress less, and move your body. Four different parameters that he's shown. If we do that optimally, that we can rid ourselves of just about any disease out there. What was those four things? Um, the four things are eat better, mm -hmm. stress less, okay. love more. Okay. Love is part of it. Relationships. Um, and mm, define love. <laughs> um, and th no, these beagles. are all be uh, beagles. Uh, oh, by the way, Alan, I've decided for the next podcast, we're going to bring Tyke here and I'm going to introduce him to oh, the fun. audience. Oh, very fun. Uh, Tyke, my beagle. So my question is, Thomas, when I think about what I'm doing internally to help my body, um, to optimize my own immune system, is the is what we're doing in terms of the microbiome mm -hmm. potentially doing the same thing but outwardly 100 percent, and it's not just the microbiome it's also what we talked about as far as the topicals we put on our skin the, the nutrients we ingest for skin health it's all connected it's all connected mm -hmm. and so when we talk about for instance the challenges in formulating uh probiotics for the skin and you know we've we've all heard this about how how you know most skincare has uh, preservative systems and such it makes it it does make it a challenge but it's not impossible and we know that because we in our research we've done formulations with live probiotics that uh, work very well um, it is a challenge and it's going to take some you know shifting in, in the uh, infrastructure of uh, the skincare industry or dermatology industry but it's one of those things where if we're truly going to holistically look at what we call the biome which is not just the microbiome or the skin but together the biome really f for the sake of aging we have to do everything it, you know, because if we, uh, from the inside out, do everything right, and then we forget about the microbiome and we're slathering all sorts of inflammatory substances on our skin, mm -hmm. how is that not going to lessen the benefits? You know, because it's both ways. It's inside out and it's outside in. Mm, I love that. So, yep. you know, we, we're kind of out of time for most. Uh, we, we have quite a bit more that I think we're going to have to do a... A part two. Okay. Part two uh, of this of this topic. Maybe this we can topic. get Doris back on. Um, since she's a friend of the podcast, I think she's contractually obligated. So <laughs> we're not contractually. But <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what is it they say? Uh, a uh, verbal contract is binding <laughs> in the state of New York. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, um, so thank you everybody um, from Media World here in Dallas, Texas. This is the Skin Science Podcast, and I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock. Thank you for your eyes and ears. We hope you gleaned something from this conversation. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you'd like us to cover, please message me on insta at dr.t.hitchcock. And if we didn't get to your questions from this week, which I did record, um, we will get to them next time. So from all of us here at Crown Laboratories, remember that skin science is for life. Goodbye for now. Goodbye, everyone.